first, I'd uh, like to thank uh, Deputy Ma for inviting me to give a uh, seminar here today. And what I'm going to talk about is the Chinese energy investment along with the Belt and Road Initiative. In the last few years, uh, other than those places Deputy has mentioned by some of the Harvard and Chinese universities, actually I spent a few years in Beijing working in some think tanks. And at the same time, it was the period when this initiative was created. And throughout those periods, I started to kind of to observe what is the actual development of what it means, and more importantly is that how is it linked with the energy uses. For myself, my research uh, started from uh, the uh, Eurasia energy cooperation, for example, the oil and gas cooperation between China and Ono, the energy policy in China domestically, and some climate change issues as well. And as I mentioned, because it is about the duration, uh, as time goes by, it will share a similar geographical scope with the Belt and Road Initiative. And that's why, after 2015, people put a head on me for my research, which is the Belt and Road Initiative. And today I'm going to explain, uh, first of all, I'm going to briefly uh, first of all, I'm going to briefly explain what the Belt and Road is, and I'll also try to link it with the energy cooperation. And in the second part, uh, I will uh, go through a couple of questions that I come across these years, both from the Chinese side and the Western side, which is uh, uh, which uh, with regard to the Belt and Road Initiative. So first of all, there are a few things that we may need to pay attention to uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, a lot of people try to ask what is Belt and Road. Actually, uh, some people try to understand it with an economic perspective. Some people look into it with a geopolitical one. Some people understand it as a development framework. And actually, it is a combination of all of them. And it is essentially a Chinese vision or the vision of Xi Jinping of the future regional integration of Eurasia. They try to link everything together. And there are a few uh, priorities of interconnections. In policy, infrastructure, finance, trade, and humanities. And that's why we can see that there are economics, there are politics, there are security agenda behind the initiative. And one, the most important part is that the region along the Belt and Road are all rich in resources and energy, and of course, the investment opportunities as well. So we can look at some data in a map, and we will see the linkage between Belt and Road and energy easily. This map, uh, um, this map are based on the data around uh, six months after the Belt and Road was officially announced in 2015. So it's, uh, it's pinning out the projects that are agreed, uh, uh, agreed under the Belt and Road uh, framework. As long as there is a new statement or announcement from, from the company, then they will mark it down. So we can see all those projects uh, uh, categorized in finance, energy, transportation, health industry, constructions, communications, and some product agreements. If we single out the energy ones, which are those in orange, we can see that actually there are a lot of them. And actually, uh, for those who are uh, related to heavy industry and construction, uh, actually, I mean, they are also related to energy because it can be the construction of a refinery or it can use, or uh, it can be some industry that are heavily used electricity. So we can see that uh, energy investment is a very important uh, component in, the, uh, in this initiative. And the Belt and Road Initiative uh, involves plenty of investment and projects prioritizing infrastructure. And we have to understand what are the intentions behind this initiative. And then we will understand why there are so many energy projects or cooperation along, along this region. 
Now China is trying to solve some problems, or they are trying to face some challenges nowadays. And they are free of them, uh, at least three of them. The first one is about the overproduction and overcapacity. And energy investment is a very good medium for China to solve this or to transfer its overcapacity uh, overseas. And secondly, uh, those investments can help China to boost the development in its second and third tiers region. And lastly, it is more about a traditional uh, Chinese wisdom, which is that uh, the interconnection between cities or towns can boost the development and eventually uh, the, the uh, regional stability. We know that China is very big, and actually the economic gap between or amongst uh, Chinese cities are also very big. The one on the right hand side, it is not places like Shanghai or Hong Kong, actually it is Suzhou. We can see that China is experiencing a very rapid uh, economic growth. But at the same time, cities in the west, um, something like the picture of the photo on the left hand side, and there is a very big gap between the development uh, in different regions. And for the better world itself, it is not targeting those on the coastal area because they are developed already. What China wants to do is to help the developing regions, which means those on the west. And this region is actually connecting to the regions of the Belgian Road along the Eurasia. Let's go back a little bit. And why do they have to help those regions? It is because it is not just because of the economic. Economic. It is also because of the regional security and political stability reasons. Because as I mentioned, there is a kind of a traditional mindset of the Chinese government that interconnections will bring development and this will lead to economic growth. And as long as the people feel they can enjoy the economic benefits, then they can maintain a stable society. Uh, we are not trying to judge if this wisdom is correct or wrong. Uh, there might be different, different understanding or analysis. But what I want to tell is that this is what the Chinese government believes in. Actually, there is uh, another a word in something like, uh, if you want to be rich, then you have to first build the road. And this has been happening in, I mean, throughout the Chinese history, and this is repeating in the Belgian Road Initiative. And why those regions? I mean, this region. We know that, um, for example, Xinjiang, Xinjiang, compared to Shanghai, it is, uh, they, they may face more security challenges because they are surrounded by unstable regions, those in Central Asia, where you may find the problem of uh, terrorism. And what Chinese government believes is that as long as they can stabilize uh, the, the, the region, then they can help the security of Xinjiang. Then there will be less political issues as well. And in order to do that, they cannot simply send some military troops there. What they need to do is to boost the development there. Because what the what they think is that uh, the the instability in those regions are actually uh, a consequence of the backward development in the region. So there will be a few priorities in the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, we mentioned that there are a few interconnections, infrastructure policies, trade, finance, and culture, which is very comprehensive, and all among them. Infrastructure comes first. So basically, all the projects along the Belt and Road Initiative prioritize infrastructure. And for energy, you know that energy is always about infrastructure. It can be pipeline, it can be national grids, refineries, and this is not the end. Because if you have a refinery or you invest in an oil field, you know, remote places, then normally you need to build the roads, you need to build the harbors, the ports or even you may need to build a, a some house or apartments for the workers. So all of these are, all of 
this uh, infra infrastructure package. And this is what uh, the Chinese government wants. And that's why if you are a foreign, uh, a foreign investor, and if you can like, uh, 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 repackage your, pro uh, your, your investment project as an infrastructure project, then this will look more attractive to the Chinese side. And this, is, uh, this photo is what I want to uh, emphasize, that energy project is not just about energy or energy uh, facilities. Because though you have the lesser the gas storage facilities here, and at the same time you need to have a port. So the energy project is always a combination of infrastructure from different sectors. And this is more presentable to the Chinese investor if he wants to attract them to, uh, to, to, to pay for all those things. Because the infrastructure itself, it is not, again, it is not just about energy. As long as there are construction opportunities, then this means that there is a chance for the Chinese company to export its overcapacity. And this requires infrastructure. So this requires construction. And the second, second priority in the uh, Belt and Road Initiative is actually the neighborhood. It is on the top strategic priority. And why is that? Because this can connect with the Chinese cities. In the Belt and Road Initiative, we, we find that there are, uh, a num there are numbers of corridors in the Belt and Road. Um, there are at least six of them. Uh, for example, the one connecting Mongo Mongolia and Russia, one connects Central Asia and one connecting Europe, one to Pakistan, another one to Southeast Asia, and, and the final one, or, 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 which is a sewage. And now China is still expanding or developing new, new routes. For example, they are uh, exploring uh, some routes through the Arctic. But what here is that, I mean, if there is a corridor, this means that it will connect cities together. So it is connecting a foreign cities, let's say, for example, in Central Asia, for example, let's say, Amati or Astana, they are connecting it with Xinjiang. Then this is a way, or this uh, follows the mindset or the concept of the Belt and Road of interconnectivity. The investment of China, of the, China, of the Chinese company, is not just about a project overseas. What they want to do is to link it back to China in order to boost the development. So you always see some plans or the map trying to link different ports together. This is a way to link regions together. And based on all these corridors, we, uh, the Chinese government also divide the countries into different economic zones, which, is, uh, which have their own reference to the foreign projects. And this is a new concept of development. There are different economic zones as well. But uh, when it goes back to energy, then uh, the investment reflected in the Belt and Road Initiative are or follows four interconnections. The first one, as we mentioned, is the prioritized infrastructure, the connection of infrastructure. The second one is an upgrade of the energy industry or a kind of in, uh, integration of it. Then it goes to the finance system. And the fourth one is a, a relatively new concept. Or I call it a sustainable development, or more precisely, it is the green finance. And finally, what we cannot ignore is the multilateral governance because this need to some new international organizations which is led by China or Asia. Okay, the first one, which is the infrastructure, uh, it can be any kinds of infrastructure, as I mentioned, roads, railways, pipelines, refineries, national grids. But the key point here is that it has, they have to let the Chinese company to do the work. So, in most of the agreement along the Belt and Road Initiative, there are some sort of conditions, like they have to use the Chinese companies, Chinese workers, or Chinese equipments, because this is a way to transfer the productivity. And secondly, uh, it is about the uh, industrial chain. Um, we know that China is acquiring a lot of assets along the Belt and Road, and 
In the past, they look into the oil fields, the gas field, which is from the upstream sector. And actually, this is not just, I mean, they are not just looking for the resources. They are also looking into the midstream and the downstream sector. They, different companies invest in different sectors. And according to the Belt and Road, I mean, the official document of the Belt and Road, they are managing to integrate them a vertical integration of it. It will be very, very difficult, uh, or it may take a very long time, but actually this is um, what CNPC or the other SOEs are doing. And eventually this will create a new regional market or even a, a, a new free trade area. Then it comes the financial system. All the energy projects involves huge investment, a lot of money. As long as there's projects, then there's funds. And for the Chinese company, they don't have their own money to do the investment. What they have to do is to make the loan from, let's say, CDB or the Agricultural Bank or the Export and Import Bank. And this is some sort of finance uh, uh, practice. And, and what the Chinese government wants to do is to advance this practice. They want to use more Chinese money in all this investment or even to set up some new financial institution here. And there can be different types of uh, 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 landings. They can lend it to the Chinese company itself or they can actually lend to the buyer, which means the foreign companies, or they can lend to the government or even the SOEs. And in return, it depends on the contract. Um, the, the, the receiver can pay it back with, let's say, energy resources or even the equity of, equity of uh, uh, the project or the, even the company. And somehow, uh, I mean, this has been happening for years. This is not something new. But the thing is that if China continues to uh, uh, to, to, to use this approach, then this may create some pressure uh, along uh, uh, the regions in the Belt and Road Initiative. Because, for example, Central Asia, who has been kind of selling their uh, resources to China for years, they start, they start to think that this is they're selling it in a very cheap way. They also want to develop it. So this will uh, create some sort of conflict between the Chinese and the countries in the Belt and Road. And the equity as well. Um, I think the equity is a very good, uh, interesting point in the uh, Belt and Road investment. A lot of people ask me if, let's say, the investment in Belt and Road is a commercial one or if it is a political one. And we have to look into it case by case, and sometimes it matters to the equity. Normally, for a Chinese company, if, as especially for the construction company, if they enter the energy sector, they normally do not want the equity. Because if you have the equity, then this means that you need to manage the project and it will take a long time. What the uh, especially construction company wants to do is to build, let's say, a refinery. I build a refinery, okay, drop down, I quit, and then I go to the next place, do a new refinery, drop down, and quit. So it is just to do the construction work but they do not want to be involved in the management from a commercial perspective because this also matters to the return rate. The return rate in the energy sector nowadays is not that attractive, especially in the oil and gas sector because the oil price is quite low. But for some other projects, for example, let's say a port uh, in Quarter, in Pakistan, the Quarter port, uh, the Chinese company uh, gets the equity. So there might be some other reasons for this, for them to invest there. And I think um, the equity is a good indicator for understanding the intention of uh, the investment. But uh, again, we cannot uh, 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 comment it uh, generally. We really have to look into it case by case. Then the green finance, this is something new. Uh, I mean, in the original, uh, I mean, the first version of the Belt and Road Policy Paper, this is not mentioned. But in the same year, um, China agreed, uh, uh, China ratified the Paris Agreement, which means they agreed to tackle the climate change issues. So the next year, I mean, uh, no, uh, two years later in 2017, 
uh, during the Belt and Road uh, Summit in May, Xi Jinping's incorporate green finance and climate change into Belt and Road. They put it together. So, in short, I mean, there are a lot of uh, uh, different uh, descriptions or explanations, but in short, this implies that certain environmental conditions might be included in the Chinese investment along the Belt and Road. For example, if we look at the, uh, uh, the energy strategy, uh, which is a, 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 a policy document of the Asia, in, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, then we can see that actually they are highlighting green investment, clean investment. They do not want to invest much in coal power, or more precisely, they do not um, want to invest in those dirty projects. If your, if your coal power project is clean, then it's fine, but if it is not, then they, are not, they will not approve the lending. This is a new dimension uh, uh, in, in the Belt and Road, but, uh, from, uh, but, but at the same time, but at the same time, it is not that easy to differentiate what are clean or what are dirty or who are doing the clean job or who are doing the dirty job. On one hand, it is true that AIIB is trying to keep its investment clean to, attack, uh, to have the environmental condition attached to the investment. But at the same time, China is also is, co is continuing building a lot of coal power plants overseas. It has uh, expanding uh, uh, coal power uh, uh, investments. The thing here is that the AIIB is going to do the clean job and the other coal fire power plants are going to go through, let's say, uh, China Development Bank. So it seems that different banks will take up different tasks. And uh, finally, uh, it is the multilateral governance. And this matters a lot because a lot of people uh, ask if Britain World is going to create a new order. And we can imagine that, we can imagine that uh, if China has to set up a new order or create a more favorable environment for its investment along there, they, then they have to have a new rec some rec new regulations, new governance, or even new order. And in the very beginning, uh, the Chinese government claims that the Belt and Road is a flexible one. Uh, it is a easy one, a friendly one. Everyone can join and live. And they are not going to set up any rules. But logically speaking, if there are so many development projects or investment projects along the Belt and Road, then we can assume that there might be some new rules or some new platforms for, 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 for those companies or for those countries to join. And why is that? If you look at AIIB uh, uh, membership, actually it is growing. It includes the Asian members, uh, those from Europe, or even they are inviting the rest of the world. So at some point, the expansion of the AIIB is kind of like overlapping with what the World Bank or Asia Development Bank or IMF is doing. We will come back to this point uh, at, uh, at our second part. Then we have to, uh, uh, before we uh, look more into the energy investment here, then we have to understand where does the Belt and Road comes from? Or does other developed countries have similar plans? Or we always compare it with the Marshall Plan? Actually, almost every major developed country or major power have their own idea of the Silk Road. Silk Road is not just a Chinese concept. Central Asia have their own ideas. Indians have their own idea of Silk Road. US, uh, especially uh, Hillary Clinton, has the Silk Road plan. Even Japan, Korea, Russia have their own Silk Road. So what are the differences between them or are they overlapping? Then we have to look at what the Europeans have done. Europe, after the World War, is just collapsed. It just collapsed. Then, if it collapsed, which means every, uh, because in the wartime, there are a lot of bombing there, so the roads, the house, all crackdown. 
Then they need new development. They need funding, and they have to connect different regions, different markets together. And it sounds very similar to what the Belgian world wants to do. And actually, throughout these few decades, what Europe has been doing is to connect different countries, regions, and cities together through railways, through electricity grids, through, through pipelines, and through uh, telecommunication systems. And we know that Europe is now well connected from all this uh, uh, perspective, from Missions Greece or other railways. And they have different plans. The Tran European Transport Network, Energy Network, Telecommunication Network. Why they are doing this? Because they want to create an internal market. They want to link different markets together, especially to link the remote markets, those far away. For example, those in Eastern Europe, back uh, to link it to the central market because this can reinforce the economic and social cohesion, especially in a post-war time. Then this can promote interconnections of national networks, and eventually this can help the development of the region to bring it strong again. So it sounds so similar to the Belt and Road Initiative, and what here what I want to say is that the Belt and Road Initiative is doing something similar to the uh, of the other powers. So at the end of the day, if the Belt and Road is as successful as the trans European network, then we can expect that there will be a network of infrastructure all along Eurasia. In Europe, they already have a very mature network here. And if the Belgian world is also, also successful, then logically they are going to follow the path of Europe and they will have their own network here. Then, if it is something big like this or amazing like this, then actually there are a lot of doubts or there are a lot of questions. And here I summarize on five questions that I already, uh, always come across. First of all, where are the money or are there any central coordination? If you are a foreign investor or you have a project, uh, let, uh, let's say from Europe, and you, you visit Beijing and ask for investor, then you must ask the question, whom I am going to talk to, whom I should talk to, uh, from the, which department from the government or which company? And this is very difficult to find out the correct one because everyone, every department, every company in China are telling you that they are responsible for the Belt and Road projects. Every department, every ministry, or even every university have their own Belt and Road, Belt and Road uh, centers or, or, or departments. So. Actually, they, are, they don't have much coordination between them, and it is quite weak in operation. Of course, sometimes uh, on the news or in some forums, you may see Xi Jinping step up and say that uh, what Belt and Road is going to do, what are our targets. But the question is, who is going to follow up with that? It can be the Minister of Foreign Affairs, it can be the Minister of Commerce, or it can be the NDRC. And the coordination between all these ministries are always big. And this is what we call as a fragmented governance in the energy sector of China. And, and that's why if we have to really understand the investment of the Belt and Road, it is not a top-down approach. It is more like a bottom-up approach. Which means if you want to, uh, to let's say, join this game, then first of all, you need a project. Overseas, if you got the contract of the, uh, if, let's say, if you are a Chinese investor and you got the project, or let's say at least an LOI, then you bring it back to China. Then this can trigger the finance mechanism, which means you can borrow the money from the bank. But without that particular document, you can't start the mechanism. The money is just there, but you cannot get it. And what the government wants to say is that you are able to acquire the product overseas, but it is not the way that the government is going to assign a company to do this and do that. In what, 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 I mean, in the actual practice, they are expecting the company itself goes abroad first and get the project. 
But of course, in some extreme cases, let's say if there are some meetings between uh, the leaders, let's say Putin visit Xi Jinping, then they come, uh, they finally come up with a project, let's say the at that time, which is the uh, power of Siberia, uh, the gas pipeline, uh, the largest gas pipeline in the world. And for those cases, those are exceptional. For most of the cases, they rely on a bottom up of these projects. And another, and the last point here uh, is that a lot of investment in the acts of the small countries are more like a development plan. But on the Chinese side, they always claim that they don't have that mindset, which is purely commercial. So it is quite confused for the small countries, especially those in, let's say, Africa or those in uh, South Asia. They visit Beijing. They want. They thought that there would be money for for them to for for them to do the development. But eventually, they find that they are only commercial investor, but they are no actual developer. So a lot actually. Um, I see a lot of foreigners visit Beijing, but they are very disappointed when they go go back because there is a um, gap of uh, uh, understanding. There are a lot of misunderstanding. And even for the projects out there, there can be a lot of risk of different kinds, political, environment, and so so on. For example, the Millstone Dam in uh, Myanmar, it creates a lot of political, environmental, and so so risk, and which was delayed for a long time. Another thing is the environmental problem. China is expanding its investment in copper power plants overseas, as I mentioned they kept exporting it. One reason behind is that we know that there are serious uh, uh, smoke in China nowadays, the air pollution, and what the Chinese government is trying to do is to shut down all those coal fire power plants. And yes, they are doing this, but the thing is that for those coal fire power plants companies, they, can, they have to keep their business ongoing. If they should have to shut down the plants domestically, then they have to find a way out. And that's why they start to invest overseas. And for all these regions, uh, if you go to ask NDRC why the Chinese company are investing there, is this clean enough? Normally, they would try. They would try to explain that yes, for those countries, uh, they are very. They are still. De they are developing countries, so they have to solve the energy problem first. Then. They, have, they can think of something, uh, uh, the clean energy. So it's somehow um, uh, contradicts with what uh, the green finance or, or what the Belgian world is claiming. And of course, nowadays, I mean, uh, at this moment, this won't be a big problem because they are still building. But in the long run, if they start to operate and if they failed to regulate them or monitor them uh, correctly, then eventually this will create a lot of social problem and complaints will be healed. And for the progress, is the, uh, is the Chinese economic slowdown hindering the Belt and Road Initiative? And actually the answer is yes and no. At some point, um, the economic slowdown is somehow a motivation for the Chinese companies to go to abroad, to, to keep the business ongoing to survive. But one thing here in the last few years is that uh, we observe that a lot of projects are being delayed or even put aside because of some domestic political consideration. At that time, there was a serious uh, corruption issue in China or there is an anti-corruption campaign. And that's why a lot of um, SOEs are hesitating in signing big deals without begging uh, the blessings. Even there are attractive opportunities, but they tend to put it aside for a while. And actually, if you look at the progress of the Belt and Road Initiative, we find that, yes, they announced a lot of projects, but a lot of them are being cancelled eventually. So this is kind of they talk more than they do it, or they just agree or they sign a contract on uh, undoable projects. 
Then for energy itself, a lot of people ask if the Belt and Road is a way for China to acquire energy resources, or it is a way for China to enhance energy security. And actually the answer here is no. Nowadays, uh, I mean the situation now is quite different from what was done in 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Because, uh, I mean in the past, China goes abroad, look for oil fields, look for gas fields, they pay attention to the quantity, how many energy resources they can import from overseas. But now they pay more attention to the quality of the project. Because there is a transformation in the energy policy from quantity to quality. They now start to pay attention to the, let's say, the return rate of the project, the risk of the of those countries, or if they can have a more mature business model integrating different facilities or even markets. Because uh, the Chinese experience in investing in places like Sudan, uh, we know that there are a lot of conflict there. It was kind of like uh, considered as a mistake, or, 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 or it is kind of like a lesson. And now a lot of SOEs learn the lesson and they, won't, they don't want to repeat the mistake again. And that's why they, can, they have to have a better investment strategy. So they focus more to the quality instead of purely chasing for uh, the amount of resources. And we know that the Belt and Road is a huge region. Then the thing here is that uh, those regions okay for investment, uh, are there any risk or actually who are they? We cannot assume everyone on the Belt and Road to be a same counterpart. And I try to categorize them into, uh, uh, into four. And actually most of them are not that cooperative. The first one is the money seekers. When I was in Beijing, I come across a lot of people visiting Beijing and suddenly tells the Chinese side that they are an uh, uh, old friend of the Silk Road. They suddenly comes and tell you that, oh, I am an old friend of the Silk Road for thousands of years. And it was so strange, we have never known that they are so friendly. And actually what they want in the trip, of course, is the money from the investor. But always they go back with disappointment because you cannot simply invest in such a better way, you have to analyze the projects, the quality, and etc. And the second one is the competitors. And actually, as I mentioned, most of the powers along the Belt and Road has their own idea of Silk Road. And it is not something new or something conceptual. They are really working on it. But only the difference is that they don't really talk about it. For example, Russia, they have their own idea of Eurasian Union. It is kind of like a, a cow for the former Soviet Union's countries, including, for example, Central Asians. Um, it is competing with the Belt and Road Initiative because their strategy or what they are doing are similar. And Russia is doing even uh, more advanced, which means, for example, they are thinking of using a, 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 the same currency in the region, this is, which is uh, very difficult for the Chinese. And and if we look at Japan or if we look at India, they have their own idea or own plan of uh, the Silk Road. And actually, they are also investing in the Silk Road region. If we look at, let's say, Southeast Asia, the investment from Japanese is actually larger than the total investment of Chinese. It is uh, quite a surprising, uh, surprising uh, 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 data. But we can see that all these countries are trying to uh, get a part of the biscuit. And then uh, some neighbors are trying to utilize the Dutch and Road as a leverage in their negotiation. Because uh, for all those countries along the Dutch and Road, they, they are looking what China is doing. For example, Putin. He knows that China or Xi Jinping is very ambitious. They knows that China wants to expand their investment. <coughs> and that's why he is not just sitting there. He knows the strategy, how to utilize this. For example, 
uh, in 2015, Putin officially welcomes upstream investment from Chinese, which means they allow the Chinese company to go to Russia and buy the oil and gas field, which was extremely diff difficult in the past. But for uh, in, in the following two or three years, nothing much has happened. Each does not mean that Russia is not selling, but they are only using the Chinese investor as a leverage to get a better price from the other buyers. For example, uh, this uh, there, there is an oil, oil and gas with the Tars Durya in the East Siberia, which is owned by Rosneft, and they want to sell it. And they have been discussing this uh, uh, this this deal with a Chinese company for a long time. But right before they closed the deal, an Indian company popped up and they got the contract with a slightly higher price. What Putin wants to show is that they they want the renminbi, but he doesn't want to want the other things that he has to rely on the renminbi. He is pay, he is trying to balance uh, different buyers. And similarly, um, the quarter part, which I will come back uh, in the next few slides, is another case. Those small countries, uh, Myanmar or whatever, they somehow they know that China wants to invest, so they let them to invest. As long as there is money, why not to let them to invest? But after they invest, they take the infrastructure. Can they deliver what China wants to do? Is another question. And for a lot of small countries, uh, for example Sri Lanka, uh, on the news we may see that China is buying a port there or a factory there. We feel that they are buying the country. But actually, for all a lot of these small countries, they are very smart. When Chinese companies approach them or buy a port. The other day, they will go to tell Russia saying that, oh yes, you see the Chinese company invest in a port, it is valuable, maybe you can invest in the refinery next to it because the Chinese company will boost the development in that region. Then in the third day, they will go to India, then go to Japan and Korea and tell them to do the same thing. So eventually, if we look at the investment map in, in those small countries, we will find that China is not the only investor there. Normally, we will find but another project from Japan, from Korea, from Russia, from everyone. So, although the small countries, they, and of course, um, in terms of size, they are really small compared with a big economic, but they are very smart in balancing all those big powers. And finally, uh, which, uh, which I refer to the trouble making regions, the budget work initiative include Middle East, and Middle East is a hot potato. And it is not that easy to handle. And what China wants to invest there is the nuclear power plants, which is very dangerous and very sensitive. And eventually, if China invests so many things there, then it will be dragged into the regional security of the region. Then the US may have another reason to press China uh, uh, for, for, for more contribution to the regional security, then, then we will see the question of if China will continue to keep its principle of non-interference of, uh, of the region. One case here is that um, I want to highlight is the quarter port, which is a very hot news now. Uh, China invest in a quarter port, and what they are claiming is that this port can be turned into a logistic hub and an energy hub because it is right next to the Middle East. So let's say the oil and gas can be transported to the quarter port, and then it can be transported through Pakistan and then to Xinjiang. And what the Chinese government or what the news saying is that this can bypass the Malacca, the so-called Malacca uh, dilemma here which is a shorter, shorter, which much shorter distance. But in reality, this is repeating the mistake of the Yama case 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh, during the time of uh, uh, Hu Jitao, he has a concern if the Malacca here will be somehow blocked by the US Navy, because most of the oil exported to China are coming through this narrow strait. And if it's blocked, then 
China will be in big problem, and that is their concern. And that's why they have to look for an alternative route. And that's why they have built a new pipeline here. New pipeline here uh, connecting the Indian Sea and, 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 and China through Myanmar. The original idea is to create an alternative route by passing Malacca to release all those military concerns. But after 10 years passed, uh, this, this, this map shows the, how the pipelines run. One gas pipeline, one oil pipeline linking the sea with uh, Yunnan province of China. So the oil and gas from the Middle East can offload here, then transfer to China through, through this pipeline. It sounds good, but in reality, if we look at the map of Myanmar, all these soldiers being some military bases, there are a lot of conflicts all along the pipeline. So the original intention of the pipeline is to enhance some sort of energy security, but the design of the pipeline is creating, or the, 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 the root of the pipeline is creating some new security problem. And actually, it is the same for the quadruple idea. Quadruple it sounds like to be a new route for China to connect itself to the Middle East by passing the whole sea, whole Indian Sea and South China Sea. But the thing is that if you look at Pakistan, which it is this part, it is next to a very, uh, it itself is already a very uh, a risky region. If you look at the index, the most extremely risky one is the one those in red, and those regions with high risk are in orange. And Pakistan is full of different kinds of risk. It can be political risk, it can be a terrorist, or it can uh, be some climate issues as well. They are, uh, they are dropped or even they are flooding. And it is right next to the uh, terrorist zones of the Afghanistan as well. So choosing this new path would it be a good idea for 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 logistic of some strategic uh, uh, products? It is a big question mark for China. And finally, the last point here is that is uh, we are going to ask if BRI is introducing a new investment order. In, nowadays, we have the World Bank, the IMF, or the Asia Development Bank, and a common thing of them is that uh, the world and share are quite unbalanced. The dominant one is the US or Japan, and this is not what the Chinese government wants, or at least they think that this is not a favorable environment for, for their harmonious, harmonious uh, investments. So we have uh, the AIIB, the new one. And in the previous slides, we can see that the, the membership scale are quite similar. So the function or the scope are a little bit overlapping, especially between Asia Infrastructure Development Bank and Asian Development Bank. They are focused on Asia. But the difference is that AEIIB is, uh, uh, is somehow led by China or at least Asian countries. So there could be some political implications. The Chinese government uh, kept has been uh, has been disclaiming that they are uh, they will introduce a new investment order. They say that this is just for investment. They are uh, this is just for mutual benefits, mutual prosperity. But if we only focus on the projects, we know that all those projects, the pipelines, the railways, the roads. They are transnational ones, and they will somehow chain up all those regions. Because if you have a pipeline, it is going to cross through the border, cross, cross through the whole territory, linking up different countries together. For example, uh, the Central Asia gas pipeline with China, it is linking up China with uh, three other Central Asian countries. And it is just like a chain. It's chained up China with its neighbors physically. And at some point, they need a new regulation platform in order to discuss, let's say, discuss the gas business, or to protect the investment, or for energy. More important is the transit of energy, transit 
of oil transit, of gas, or even transit of electricity. I think no one wants to repeat uh, the dispute between Russia and, uh, and Europe. At that time, there is a dispute of uh, the transit of energy, and somehow Russia can construct the supply of gas. Of course, there are some issues with Ukraine as well, but all those risks of political concern or, com or commercial dissettlement result in Russia failing to deliver the gas to Europe in a cold winter. And this is something what China does not want to see. And in the last winter, just in the last winter, Central Asia suddenly reduced the gas supply to China. And what was happening in China at that time? They were shifting from burning gas, uh, the sorry, using gas to, uh, uh, they are shifting to, they are shifting from coal to gas, so they need more gas. And at the same time, if Central Asia reduces the gas supply, this means that there, are, there is a shortage of gas in China, and eventually they have to go back to coal. So we can see that they, they, are, uh, uh, they need some sort of new regulations or at least platform for protecting the investment and the transit of energy. But unfortunately, China still lacks a relevant international legal framework of energy investment. And all this investment, because they are physical ones, they, this will force China to move forward from a bilateral approach to a multilateral, which means some sort of new institution will be formed at some point. And of course, China will not I, uh, what we understand is that China will not simply join an existing organization. What they prefer is to learn from the experience and set up their own. And AIIB or even the uh, Belt and Road Energy Club are some examples of this model. And we will see uh, at least some new uh, um, framework for, for energy cooperation in in, in, in the Belt and Road. And that's all for my presentation here. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll just leave the room to the floor. And thank you very much. From the Government and International Studies Department at the Hong Kong HKU here. Um, and I'm also uh, coordinating the European Studies Program of French Stream. And I'm also happy to be associated with uh, Daphne Ma here on one of her uh, research projects. So my question is regarding Europe and the uh, port of uh, Paris in Europe that was uh, basically bought by uh, Cisco, a state-owned enterprise of uh, China. And you were saying something very interesting in your presentation, which was uh, very informative and highly comprehensive on such a big topic, actually, I must say. And you were saying that uh, the intent of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative can be seen through the equity. And basically, you can see the share of the private investment and the state investment. So what is your take? I'd like to know that. What is your take on the uh, overtaking by China through Cisco of the Paris port? Is this to you only a commercial operation or is it also somehow a political operation? Thank you. Uh, I think this is a extremely typical cases. Yes. Um, because a lot of people, whenever they break from the news that there is a new there, there is a new investment, they will immediately ask the question if it is a new investment or it is a political one. And to be frank, um, you, you, you have to analyze them one by one to understand what is the model of the investment there and what is the nature of the company. Because in most cases, or sometimes the companies meet some sort of quota, investment quota, and that's why it goes to the investment. And actually, they are even asking how uh, the overseas companies if they have projects for them. And sometimes, uh, for the construction companies, they go to invest in another sector. They do not understand how to manage their sector. So they actually they don't want to do that. They just want to build something, to use the equipment, to transport or transfer their uh, mobility, to do something. So it is very pretty, I mean, this is pretty straightforward. But for some cases, for some cases, 
you can't find a clear commercial intention behind it. And if it is the case, then even after a few years, it will be very difficult for them to justify a low return rate. This was the case for a lot of our CMPC investment, for example in Sudan, for example in Central Asia. Actually, internally, they are being criticized for this for, for a very long time. And for most of these big projects, let's say even for, for the, uh, uh, the power of Siberia, the largest gas pipeline in the world, between China and Russia, in the very beginning, CNPC does not want it because they cannot justify the commercial return, the investment of the pipeline, the infrastructure is just too too high. In the long run, they are not sure if they can sell the gas in the Chinese market because it is still not yet reformed. They have a lot of question marks and they do not want to do this deal. And, and at that time, um, in, in that year, Putin he visited Shanghai. And somehow, after he visited Shanghai, then the staff of CNGC are called and they have to draft the contract of the deal overnight, within some like 48 hours. So it was a last minute decision made by CNGC. Who thinks that yes, Putin comes here, then we have to show something, show something that's critical or whatever, then we have to agree that. In terms of strategy or politics, it is a very, it is a beautiful project. But for a lot of people from the industry, they question it. And I, I think for the belt and road, it is difficult or it is very complicated because it is so broad. Some part of it is for the politics, some part of it is commercial, and some part of it is development. Because that's it for the for this gas part, actually it can help. Uh, China to boost the development in the northeastern provinces, which they really need it. And this can also help Russia to develop uh, uh, this area, which is from a scrap. And I, I think for, for a project, it, you, you may have to follow the timeline, every, every story, before you can justify uh, what intentions are included in this. Fine. Well, thank you for that fascinating talk and very insightful. Um, I'm Prashant Vizay, I work at WWF here in Hong Kong. Um, I have two questions for you, mind. Um, one was, um, if you look at the, uh, what you're suggesting, it resembles um, a lot of the kind of investments that the World Bank uh, was making in the 70s and 80s. As we know, a lot of those loans went bad, and as a result, um, things like structural adjustments and uh, measures were taken to try to um, apply pressure to, to actually get the, extract the money back off uh, from the developing countries. Do you still foresee that as a possibility? Um, my second question was, um, a lot of the rhetoric that uh, Xi Jinping has been making, probably in, in the articles of the AIIB, um, have sort of green environmental kind of tinges to them. Um, from what you're suggesting, that a lot of the products themselves are bubbling up, bottom up from coal manufacturing equipment, suppliers, and all this. How, how, is it, how is China going to reconcile this kind of ambitions for it to be a green um, belt and road, the reality of it being a largely coal fund belt and road? Uh, AIIB is still a very new bank, and I think they are still developing their policy coordination or the strategy. But one thing very important is that most of the staff of AIIB are actually from World Bank. So they are borrowing the people people from World Bank to work in AIB. And at some point, um, from my observation, AIIB is quite different from the other Chinese and CDD or whatever, because they are more tends to follow the international laws, which they help them to keep the standard, no matter investment, the credit, or even the green requirement. But this is just AIIB, because the non-green investment, if there is, let's say, some let's say low quality copper power plants, they can go through the other banks. There are a lot of options, CDB or the export or import uh, uh, brand or, or agricultural bank. AIIB somehow, its scope can represent the ambition of 
belt and road. But it does not, I mean, belt and road is not just about AIIB. There are a lot of different players. So it is one of many cars of China when they need to do the green investment, they, they can show the card of AIIB or even or even the South South uh, Climate Change Fund for the development countries, which Xi Jinping announced after the press agreement, but actually uh, they somehow have not yet delivered it. But if they want to need they need to do some pure investment or uh, need a power plant, then they can go through the other other banks. So the, the standard uh it, it varies. I think he will tell you that's the money, and it's going to be nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And uh, my name is Hongmen. I'm a student in uh, energy policy in China, uh, studying. Uh, and I, uh, as I know that uh, Hong Kong is a part of the China, and Hong Kong government uh, try to promote, I can help China to promote one big one road, okay? Uh, as, as, you, as you said, there's many problems for the one big one road for the, uh, uh, such as infrastructure inv investment and something like that. So, uh, how Hong Kong can help China to, to overcome this problem? This is a very difficult question. I've been asking myself for a few years. And actually, when I was in Beijing, I was involved in some, some Belt and Road of, of research projects. And whenever I see a map there, then I will ask the question where is the port of Hong Kong? Because they are linking different port cities, different villages, different cities of mainland China with a lot of unknown names. But I never see a port of Hong Kong. Then I ask the question, where is Hong Kong? Then they will immediately ask me, Hong Kong, Hong Kong is a part of China, of course it is included in, in the agenda. But the thing is that I, um, it is not a priority at least. It might be included from a political perspective, but it is not the power of why. Because the Belt and Road, as I mentioned, it is an initiative helping China to boost the development of some backward regions, no matter overseas or in China. So cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen are not on the top priority. They want to boost the uh, the, uh, those unknown cities. And Hong Kong, to be frank, it financially or in terms of infrastructure, it is very maturely developed. So the need for further development is not that big. So in return, the question will be what Chinese cities, the other Chinese cities, can take from Hong Kong. And there are two or three possible three possible ways. One is uh, the international experience on the legal aspect, the logistics, or the finance. But in recent years, especially in, in the last five years with the uh, 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 previous uh, executive, chief executive, um, a lot of opportunity that should be in the hands of Hong Kong are now shifted or transferred to other cities. For example, G20, it is a very uh, good example. And actually, even for AIIB in the very beginning, they even proposed to have the headquarters in Hong Kong. But could it be possible politically? Now, I don't think it is that confident for Beijing to make this decision. And kind of like, um, uh, uh, now Beijing is talking about uh, to set up a uh, disputement settling center to deal with all those legal issues along the belt and road for, for the investment. They want to have one in Beijing, but actually, we not we use different laws in Hong Kong, which is common laws, which is the British law. Actually, for a lot of foreign investors, if they prefer, they will prefer a case with British law because this is what they can, they know how to handle. But as I mentioned, that this good center was will be in Beijing because it has to make sure that everything is under control. And the remaining thing is that uh, the logistic and the finance. For the logistic part, 
um, we can see that there are more and more uh, new ports or harbors or logistic hubs being built surrounding Hong Kong. They are all saying that, oh, I'm going to be the biggest manufacturer surpass Hong Kong. And I, I think we can look at the example of Europe that they are combining different regions for a bigger, uh, 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 which is an integration for, for a multifunctional areas. And I think this is what Hong Kong can learn from them. And that's why China have the idea of the Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, the, 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 the Bay Area. But the difference between Hong Kong and those cases is that, let's say in Japan, it is Tokyo with the surrounding regions. So it's obviously Tokyo will be the lead and they can coordinate everything. San Francisco is the same, New York the same. But in Hong Kong, the question will be, how will the roads to be designed to connect a different logistics on the right or on the left? All those very practical details are not that easy to solve. Then the final one, it is the finance, uh, financial center. I think for a lot of trans, I, do, I don't have the data, but I think a lot of transaction of all those uh, overseas investment will choose Hong Kong to be the transaction place because the tax is much lower. And it, it sounds very simple, but this is very practical. Other than that, I, I don't really think, um, of course, we have to say that Hong Kong is uh, one of the toughest priorities, but in reality, when they operate it, they tend to bypass it. Because for all businessmen, they, all, they don't want to pay the transaction fee to the agent. I, I think this is the reality. Thank you. I am uh, Henry. Uh, I actually read politics at King's College uh, so the same institution as you. Um, quick question. So, from my understanding, uh, China provides loans to all these countries in return to gain access to resources. But then when you were talking about the five questions that the Western nations ask, and one of them is to um, ask whether it enhances security, the energy security of China, and you said no. Can you explain why that is? What I mean, uh, what I mean is at that point is that China now is not just simply trading after the quantity or the amount of resources they are going to get. In the past, they just want the oil, they just want the gas, so they will invest no matter how expensive it is or how remote it is or how risky it is. They just want quantity, the number. But now, um, the whole energy uh, situation in China has changed. I don't think they are really lack of resources. Of course, they they are still importing it because just like all the other big powers, for example, the United States, we have to use the resources of the others first, then my own resources. This is the mindset, and that's why they kept importing it. But uh, when they do the investment, they have ten years of or twenty years of bad experience. Uh, let's say. Obviously, investing in Sudan was a bad uh, choice, which is almost a conflict zone. Um, or some other countries, they are not sure about the political stability. And for example, in Latin America, they invest there, and they cannot pay it back. And that's why now when China goes abroad, they, they are sitting on a huge capital. They have a lot of money, and they want to invest in a smart way. That's why they start to chase for quality. It, it looks into the nature of the investment itself rather than the other intentions like to acquire resources or to enhance energy security. It has not that much to do with the energy security of China itself. That's, that's why it, it, there's a change in the energy policy in China. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I just want to jump on the comparison you have made on several occasions with the Marshall Plan and then with Europe saying that the Bretton Woods initiative is not the new, other uh, nation states have done so. But those two comparisons seems to me are, are a bit awkward if you want to send a message that it's, it can be either political or commercial, because Marshall Plan and the EU are both intentionally highly political. The Marshall Plan was an economic plan, the development aid for Europe, there was no return on investment to prevent Western Europe to fall under the ideology of communism. So, and then 
the construction of the European Union. It started as the uh, a commerce area, but it is also a very highly political design with shared values. So I'm not sure that comparing the integration of Hong Kong with the neighboring area, they do have these uh, shared values uh, as of the moment. So this is just a comment. I'd like to hear from you. Uh, actually, when I talk about all the other plans, what the message, what I want to bring out is that the name of Belt and Road is new, but at the, the first time when I read into the English version of it, I, I thought I was reading the Silk Road plan of Hillary Clinton. Because they just look the same, trade, infrastructure, finance, humanity, and, and all those things. And when I look at uh, what the European has done, they are also doing the infrastructure network, linking countries together. And in, I mean, in the document at least, they mentioned that this can help to bring uh, 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 regions together, uh, social cohesion, economics. So there are different intentions. It can be politics, it can be economics, it can be social. And it, is the, it, is, it sounds so similar when and we look at the Dutch abroad. So in some cases, it is in, uh, increasing the social cohesion, especially for example in Xinjiang, and it is for stability. And in some cases, uh, it is to build a kind of like a Chinese norm for, for, a, for a better environment for the Chinese investment in those regions. So it sounds more institutional or even political. So it is, I, I think when I compare them, I, it's what I want to say, actually what I want to say is that Europe has all those needs, the need of development, and that's why they need to connect them. And after they connect them, you will have a network, and eventually you will have a new order there and new institution there. This is the logic that I want to point out, which I think Fetch and Road will follow. And it seems that it is following if you look at the case of AIIB. Hello. Uh, my name is Walton, I'm from Greenpeace. Uh, so I'll ask the question of because um, China always said that they want to be the Greenest uh, developing or developed country, and they have this belt and road initiative saying, "Oh, we're going to go green, 100 uh, percent." But obviously, we are seeing a lot of infrastructure-based uh, projects to start with, and not necessarily saying that there are no coal as well. So, how do you see this in 20, 30 years' time when we are saying we need to be carbon neutral as a whole and in, in, in the totality of the world, um, but we are having so many infrastructure projects in the next 20, 30 years, and also the coal projects that come along, not alongside, but on the, the other side of uh, Belt and Road. I think for the pollution problem, this does not really come from coal. I just leave out coal because it is very obvious. And actually for all infrastructure, it will use steel. And the consumption of steel is also highly polluted. All those in the roads are all highly polluted. This is a consequence, an avoided consequences in the development. If you ask the government, then I think normally they will say that, oh yes, those places they need go, they need development, and that's why they will help them to solve the property problem. They will bring out the property problem. I mean, in, in development studies, you have you always have to find a balance point between solving property or energy poverty, and the polluting issues. And this is somehow why we may feel that um, the initiative itself, I mean the claims itself, the content itself is somehow contradicting with each other. But at the same time, China is playing a lot of cards. So somehow at the same time, they can smoothly coordinate. That's why you have this question. So looking ahead, where do you see this going? Is there going to be more countries supporting the Belt Road Initiative, or do you see other plans like the TPP, obviously TPP except USA, TPP or the bilateral relationship between Japan and India? Would that be something to counter the Belt Road Initiative? Why not join the both and get money from both of them? If I are a small country, then I would definitely do both. For example, if you look at Central Asia, uh, Central Asian countries, 
10 years ago, they started to cooperate with China. Because at that time, they rely heavily on Russia, and they don't like that. So they need another big power to balance Russia. So they cooperate with China. And now, for example, uh, communist time, the export of gas, most of them goes to China. So China is almost their only buyer. They rely too much on China. They don't have Russia now. So they, are head, they have their head again. And now they try to look back to Russia or even Iran or even Europe to export their gas. So for the central, central uh, for the small countries, or a lot of countries on the Belt and Road, of course, if you bring a lot of money to them and say, oh, yes, of course, I'm happy. Just like in the Chinese New Year, you get a red pocket. Of course, I will say, oh, yes, Happy New Year. But the other day, I may not remember who I met. So for the small countries, they are playing the strategy of balancing big powers in order to maximize their interest. And actually, uh, as I remember, Yi Kong Yao from Singapore has once mentioned, if, you're, if a leader cannot uh, uh, if a leader only uh, tends to work with China and China balance it, then he should not be a leader for a small country. Okay. I sort of returns that question about uh, different stuff, lending uh, criteria for different banks that operate. So you, you mentioned the AIIB has <coughs> adopted a lot of more banks that criteria for their stuff. Um, is there any pressure to tighten up criteria for the other banks given that they're not big at the moment? And also, that could also much lack that if the loans were bad. Um, I assume that China's going to have to the bill. Will the criteria be tightened on the other banks? Greener, greener lending criteria, also uh, less credit will give us checks. There are too many banks. There are too many banks. There must be some banks with uh, some criteria. I, I agree that there are all the banks will follow a very general, very high uh, requirement. I, I, I don't think in practice this is the case. Even, even for the other banks, I, I mean every bank, any banks, they will find a way to, uh, to get through get this. I, I, I don't think it is uh, it, it will, it will be the Now, for the interest of time, let me draw up close to this uh, very wonderful seminar, um, very uh, comprehensive on a very difficult uh, subject matter, very important and very insightful Australian uh, So, please join me to thank Kamo once again for coming today. And also, thank several of you for your input and a uh, very uh, nice uh, conversation dialogue. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to stay behind for a chat and another round of coffee.